Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman, and uh, thank you to John and the other organizers for the very uh, kind invitation. Uh, I must say that when he asked me, uh, it seemed like a relatively easy assignment uh, to respond, but now that I'm standing here, it seems quite daunting uh, in front of a, a, such a distinguished audience and, and following uh, two such uh, excellent uh, presentations. Uh, so I'm just going to make, uh, and I should say there's sort of an, an asymmetry in my response in that uh, I uh, was fortunate enough to see John's paper in advance, but I hadn't seen uh, Philip's presentation, so I'll probably focus uh, uh, more uh, on what John said and try to integrate uh, some responses uh, to Philip's uh, presentation. So I'm going to begin making just a few uh, fairly general comments and then focus uh, mainly on the example uh, of uh, monetary union, uh, hopefully bringing out some of the themes uh, that uh, both uh, John and uh, Philip mentioned. Uh, I should begin with another apology in, um, uh, in showing you some, some economics, but it's very difficult uh, to see, uh, uh, to read uh, John's uh, paper uh, about spillovers leading to the case for collective action uh, without thinking of the, of the prisoner's dilemma game. Uh, and this is not just a tool used by economists, it's probably uh, the most commonly used tool uh, by uh, social scientists. Um, in uh, establishing the, the, the case for, for collective action. Uh, and the basic idea is that uh, uh, each player can act in a, in a non-cooperative way or a uh, cooperative way, uh, but um, if it's just left to pure self-interest, uh, each uh, uh, player uh, has a dominant strategy to do the non-cooperative thing, and you get bad uh, collective outcomes. Uh, and this will often be the case where there are spillovers from uh, one uh, party's action uh, to another. Uh, so there's a strong case uh, for coordinating, cooperating, uh, engaging in collective action uh, to get to the, uh, to the good collective outcome. Uh, so you can see that the, the, the payoffs for each player are higher and the collective payoffs are higher uh, if you can uh, coordinate uh, uh, on, on those uh, actions. Uh, and I think the game also sort of brings out uh, the uh, different aspects of nationalism that uh, Philip talked about, uh, from the point of view, you know, if the pay payoffs really do follow this structure, uh, from the point of view of national interests, there's a strong case uh, for cooperative action, for collective action, uh, for getting together in something uh, like the, the European Union. Uh, but another aspect uh, of nationalism uh, beyond national interests is national control. Uh, so you could actually recognize uh, that, there's, that your interests lie uh, in uh, uh, dealing with uh, problems in a, in, in a collective fashion, but you want to retain that control. Uh, so um, it's, there's a sort of distinction between an analysis more focused on the, on the consequences, which is related more to the interests uh, and to the, to the actions themselves. Uh, and another um, uh, sort of distinction within philosophy uh, of the uh, Kantian variety between uh, uh, a more de deontological, action-focused approach uh, versus, some, uh, versus something more focused uh, on the consequences. Uh, just picking up an example where the, the, the payoffs may be different, um, and uh, of course uh, an example that's been very much uh, in the news uh, over the last week, and that's the, the whole issue of the taxation uh, of multinational profits. Uh, and this was partly um, uh, motivated by one of Philip's uh, columns uh, earlier uh, uh, this week. Uh, now, he wasn't focused uh, on Ireland, but actually focused on, on Google, uh, and sort of asking the question, uh, even if Google is following its interests, in a sense, the, particularly the interests of its shareholders, uh, and uh, also uh, in full compliance with the law, uh, might there be uh, obligations uh, to, to act uh, in a more collectively responsible uh, way uh, in, in, in any regard? Uh, so we can sort of turn this around also uh, to look at it from a, from a country point of view. I know Philip is far too polite to bring it up um, uh, uh, in, in, in present company. Uh, but we could think about what the, the payoff uh, structure looks like. Uh, and we could actually argue, potentially, uh, that Ireland would actually be um, uh, better off uh, in the... Uh, in the non-cooperative uh, outcome, uh, not having some collective agreement uh, to have some common uh, corporation tax and a, a broader common uh, tax regime. Um, but then you can ask the question, essentially like uh, uh, Philip asked uh, in the case of Google, uh, might there be obligations 
uh, to do the, the cooperative thing that's, that's, that's better collectively uh, in any case. Uh, so I just uh, sort of throw that out uh, as something that uh, uh, might be uh, picked up in discussion and it would be uh, good uh, to hear Philip's response. Next, I just want to pick up on the other uh, question asked by John, which is uh, uh, really who decides. Um, and there's really two dimensions to that, who in a sense uh, should decide uh, and uh, who uh, legally has the, uh, has the power to decide. So I have no expertise on the legal side, so, so I'll focus on the, uh, on the more normative question. Uh, and what uh, John is, is looking at in his paper and in his presentation uh, is uh, having those decisions made effectively by direct democracy uh, or uh, having them made by uh, representative uh, government. And typically in the, in the European context, that's representative government uh, engaged in, in negotiations uh, with other governments uh, through councils of ministers, uh, but also, of course, with, with key roles of the European Commission uh, and the European uh, Parliament. And I think John brings out sort of very well the, the, the vagaries of the direct uh, democracy approach, talks about things such as uh, uh, other issues that are not related to the particular uh, question at issue uh, coming in uh, uh, to, the, to the debate and actually affecting uh, people's decisions. Uh, so I think we've all seen uh, those vagaries uh, in action. <clears throat> but I do just want to sort of put the, the other side, and this uh, uh, relates partly to what Philip said about the perception of uh, elites uh, making uh, uh, decisions and, and leading to uh, a backlash um, uh, against uh, European Union. Um, and uh, one thing we have, we have seen over the last couple of years is a significant increase in the number of rules, uh, particularly relating to, to, to fiscal integration. Uh, we had the, uh, the six-pack, um, which was very much done by uh, agreement of <coughs> uh, representative uh, governments. Um, then we had, uh, of course, the, the fiscal treaty or fiscal compact, uh, which uh, did go to, to referendum. Uh, and most recently, we have the, the two-pac. Uh, and though I expect many people in this room will know, uh, I doubt if uh, uh, the general public more generally knows that the two-pac came into force yesterday uh, and significantly affects <coughs> um, all of us uh, in terms of uh, the ability of governments uh, to pursue uh, fiscal policies with the most sort of obvious one uh, when the uh, budget uh, has to take place, it will now take place in October, um, and uh, that uh, draft budget effectively uh, will be uh, uh, examined uh, by the European Commission. <clears throat> and also there's various uh, restrictions on, on countries uh, that, would, that are in uh, financial uh, difficulties. So these are big uh, constraints. Uh, these are decisions that are effectively being made uh, by uh, elites. Uh, and I think it raises questions uh, of legitimacy when this, when, when, when this builds up. Uh, so at least with the occasional referendum, and in many, I was in, in many ways sort of impressed by the quality of the debate during the, the fiscal treaty. Uh, and at least uh, it gave people the opportunity to, uh, to understand uh, what was going on and, and, and hear these debates. Uh, so while uh, there certainly are risks associated with direct uh, democracy, um, uh, I think there, uh, there, there are risks uh, on the other side as well, and uh, uh, how that uh, uh, balance works out uh, is not that clear, but I think um, uh, there certainly are risks uh, with, the, with, the, with the path, which is, which is mainly uh, uh, the, the, the one of representative governments uh, uh, that we're on. <clears throat> so I want to take just another example um, um, of the, the various themes that we've been looking at, uh, and that is the, uh, uh, the importance of creditworthiness is how, how it's affected uh, within monetary union. And this is, I think, a very good example of, some, of something that really relates to true uh, freedom of action, <coughs> as uh, stressed by John. So sovereign creditworthiness, and particularly uh, international sovereign creditworthiness, uh, is critical to freedom in action, particularly when you have a progressive welfare state, uh, when, when the economy goes into recession, um, which is uh, going to happen more often when you have a volatile economy such as the Irish economy, uh, the deficit is going to get very large and your borrowing needs are going to get very large. Uh, and so there's huge value uh, to being able to smooth your consumption, to be able to continue uh, pursuing 
uh, high return investments, uh, and indeed to, to push a counter-cyclical fiscal policy. So the uh, creditworthiness is incredibly valuable uh, to countries. So how has that been affected uh, by monetary union? Well, one thing that we have seen, uh, and I think it wasn't fully recognized in the initial debate about monetary union, uh, is that a country, um, uh, particularly when it has a large uh, debt and, and, and deficit, uh, is <coughs> faces highly fragile creditworthiness when it doesn't have its own independent central bank that can act as lender of last resort uh, in extremis. Uh, so the debates about whether the, the Irish problems with creditworthiness related to underlying solvency, but there's almost certainly a, a sort of a clear liquidity element uh, where you can fall into essentially a bad equilibrium uh, where people uh, begin to worry about default, push up interest rates, uh, making the actual probability of default become a reality, based essentially validating those uh, um, uh, expectations. Uh, and this then becomes a significant problem when you don't have this domestic lender of last resort. And I think this is a key distinction uh, between the UK and Ireland um, uh, in terms of how uh, each country has <coughs> responded to the, to, to the crisis. Uh, uh, Ireland, uh, with not so dissimilar uh, fiscal numbers, uh, had a major creditworthiness, cri creditworthiness crisis. Uh, the UK did not. Uh, and much of this, I think, goes back to the fact uh, that Ireland didn't have its own domestic lender of last resort. So in a sense, this is a case of a negative spillover associated with, mo with monetary union, uh, where one of the things uh, that has to happen uh, as you enter monetary union uh, is that you give up this domestic lender of last resort. Uh, so here uh, we see what, what's actually happened uh, to Irish creditworthiness uh, through the crisis. This goes back to 2007 and up until uh, earlier this week. Uh, and the, the gray line is the Irish 10-year bond yield. Uh, the red line is the German 10-year bond yield. Uh, and you see this major creditworthiness crisis really erupt uh, in 2010 and actually uh, reached its peak in the middle of uh, 2011. Um, and it was a combination of... Uh, uh, concerns uh, about uh, the Irish fiscal position, and also concerns about the lack of a lender of last resort um, uh, that, that, that led to the, to the spike in bond yields. Uh, and then as the, the, on the improvement side, and the improvement, as you can see, has been dramatic, uh, and I think uh, an underappreciated element of the Irish story so far, um, but it was essentially a combination uh, of uh, the Irish government being able to demonstrate that it could uh, uh, undertake the fiscal adjustments required to be in good standing, essentially, with uh, uh, official lenders uh, who had effectively become the lenders of last resort. And also gradual improvements uh, in the structures of uh, uh, those lenders of last resort, uh, including the development of the ESM <clears throat> and also, uh, more, more recently, uh, the uh, European Central Bank's uh, OMT program. So that interaction between that lender of last resort, which is a conditional lender of last resort, being there and being able to demonstrate that you could meet the conditions uh, has been central uh, to the improvement uh, in, in Irish creditworthiness. But I just want to end on this, um, uh, essentially as another example uh, of spillovers. Uh, and here I'm just looking at the, the dynamic between uh, the lender of last resort uh, and the development of fiscal rules. Uh, so even at the beginning of EMU, where there wasn't really a, an explicit lender of last resort in place, uh, clearly the designers were concerned that in a crisis that they would have to bail out uh, the countries in, in, in trouble. Uh, and so this is an example of a spillover uh, once you were in a monetary union uh, where one country's bad policies could uh, have implications uh, for you. Uh, and this was behind the development of certain fiscal rules uh, within monetary union, particularly the, the, the rules of the stability uh, and growth pact. Uh, but I think what we're seeing uh, more recently, and I don't feel that this is always uh, uh, appreciated to the extent it should be, is the link back from the development of, uh, of fiscal rules to a strengthened lender of last resort. Uh, because really what the fiscal treaty was about was putting in place uh, rules that would give confidence uh, to develop the lender of last resort. And that's something that, that, that uh, I just didn't think uh, came out well enough uh, in, the, in the fiscal uh, uh, treaty debate. Now, it came out in, in, in one way, in a very sort of explicit way, which, which became known actually as the blackmail clause, that you wouldn't have access to the ESM uh, unless you passed the fiscal treaty. Uh, but 
the very fact it was called the, the blackmail clause uh, showed, uh, I think, a sort of a misunderstanding uh, of why uh, um, uh, the fiscal rules were sort of necessary uh, before uh, that lender of last resort uh, uh, would be uh, developed. So uh, we're seeing sort of elements of the dynamic uh, that we uh, uh, saw before. Um, you know, on the uh, one hand, um, these fiscal rules are being uh, put in place uh, externally, uh, perceived by uh, elites, uh, and I think uh, leading to uh, a backlash uh, against the, the European project, uh, at least with the fiscal uh, treaty debate, uh, uh, people had a better chance to understand what was going on. I don't think it came out uh, as clearly as it should have, uh, but you can see, I, I think, uh, the advantages uh, of uh, engaging people more uh, and having a, a more uh, legitimate uh, process. Uh, just uh, to pick on just, uh, just one final point that actually relates to uh, Philip, uh, Philip's comment uh, uh, column uh, today uh, in, the, uh, in the Financial Times, uh, where he spoke about the danger uh, of, uh, of sort of populist backlash. Uh, and on sort of both sides here, there is a danger of populist backlash. Uh, in the countries sort of facing austerity, which are feeling sort of the brunt of these fiscal rules, uh, there's a backlash against austerity generally, but uh, sort of partly against the fiscal rules. And you see uh, then pressure to ease the implementation of those fiscal rules, uh, as we've seen with the extension uh, of uh, deadlines for reaching, uh, reaching deficit targets uh, in a number of countries. But we shouldn't forget about the potential backlash on the other side, uh, which is the strengthening uh, of the lender of last resort function, uh, or more generally the strengthening uh, uh, of fiscal union. Uh, if that strengthening is conditional on uh, these fiscal rules being put in place, uh, the development uh, of uh, that, uh, th those crucial institutions of fiscal union uh, uh, could be made more difficult. And uh, just as austerity is something that we uh, don't want uh, in present circumstances for the Irish economy, we also do need uh, the, de the development of that strong lender of last resort uh, to have the continued improvements uh, in Irish creditworthiness uh, that we've seen. So again, uh, a tension between the two. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.